Yeah. Well, thank you, Simone, for the kind introduction. I also want to thank the, uh, the organizers of this conference to invite me and give me the opportunity to, to talk here about this research. So today I will talk about obstruction-free gluing for the Einstein equations, uh, which is a work I did together with Igor Rodniansky. And more generally, I will use this talk to, to advertise and present the null gluing problem for the Einstein equations which was done in a collaboration with Stefanos Aritakis and Igor Rodniansky. So um, let me give you an, an overview of the talk because we're in Vienna, the city of music. I want to use these musical descriptions. First, I'm going to have a prelude where I will generally uh, talk about gluing problems for the Einstein equations, you know, give a very short like historical motivation and show how our approach of obstruction-free gluing comes in. Then I will turn to the fugue where we will introduce the null gluing problem, uh, starting with Aritaki's work for the scalar wave equation, and then moving to the null gluing problem for the Einstein equations, and um, you know, uh, discussing the literature results that we proved. And then the outro, the coda, is going to be um, about you know, the, the title of this talk, namely obstruction-free gluing where we resolve some of the issues that remained open during the fugue. Okay. So before I go into this uh, composition, let me give you, let me present to you the motive of the talk already. First, we studied the gluing of space-like and null or characteristic initial data sets for the Einstein vacuum equations, vanishing cosmological constant, okay. By actively utilizing the quadratic nonlinearities of the constraint equations, we are able to overcome the gluing obstructions that linear methods faced. So, you know, you know implicit function theorem methods faced an obstacle that could not be overcome. And by studying the nonlinearities, we were able to overcome them. And this is what we call then obstruction free gluing. And finally, as a comment on this obstruction free gluing, from the technical side, um, we access these quadratic nonlinearities by using a large high frequency ansatz in the gluing region. Okay. So the, the produced gluing uh, will, will be of large size and have high frequency terms in it. And I will explain, of course, in detail what I mean with high frequency gluing. So let's start um, with the general uh, introduction of gluing problems. Now, first, first, I need to um, set up, you know, the Einstein equations and just the notation, so we all know that we're talking about the same thing. So I look at uh, rich is equal to zero on the Lorentz in four manifold. The dimension is four. Um, Minkowski space time is the trivial space time. We have, we all know it. Uh, an important role is also played by the Schwarzschild family in this talk, and the way I want to think about them is as a one-parameter family. Um, where the parameter, you know, describes the mass, and in particular, I want to think of them as spherically symmetric. Okay? I want to remember that they're spher spherically symmetric. Um, while on the other hand, um, the curve family of rotating black holes, I want to think of them for today as a ten-parameter family, parameterized by the mass, linear momentum, angular momentum, and center of mass. Okay, and we all know, of course, that you know, I said the linear momentum zero, the angular momentum to zero, and center of mass to zero, I get exactly the Schwarzschild back. Okay. Um, so much about the, about the basic setup. Now, I want to um, recapitulate these initial value problems for the Einstein equations, because they will be guiding our discussion today. Namely, um, you can set up two, two different initial value problems. Well, using that the Einstein equations are hy hyperbolic, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the space-like initial value problem, the Cauchy problem, um, which is well studied in uh, Riemannian geometry, for example. Um, and on the right-hand side, we have the characteristic initial value problem, where initial data for the Einstein equations is posed on two transversely intersecting null hypersurfaces. And uh, given the data, you, you develop into the future. And here you develop into the future domain of dependence of, this, uh, of these two null hypersurfaces. Now, we all know that 
uh, initial data for the Einstein equations uh, comes with a little caveat, namely we have to solve the constraint equations. Similar to the Maxwell equations, the Einstein equations are subject to such uh, constraints. And it is well known that in, uh, in the space-like setup, the space-like Cauchy problem, these constraint equations have an elliptic character, while um, for the characteristic initial data, these constraint equations have a transport equations character. And what do I mean precisely by uh, this? On the left-hand side, uh, I can easily write out the space-like constraint equation. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. of the scalar curvature operator uh, of, this, of the metric G as an elliptic operator. I think of the divergence uh, operator as also an elliptic operator. And so hence, this has some elliptic character. While here, the transport equations um, are characterized by the fact that I have derivatives along the outgoing and ingoing null geodesics. So I have here L, the outgoing null geodesic, and L bar, the ingoing null geodesic. And these transport equations are es essentially, you can think of them as ODEs uh, along L and L bar. So for example, what I wrote out here is the first variation equation, where I'm just saying that um, the induced matrix G as I go along L uh, it changes like the second fundamental form of that sphere. Okay. So, so this is well known, uh, you know, this is uh, the, the, the first variation equation. And then here, um, this is the celebrated Rajaduri equation, which tells me that, you know, if I go along L, the null expansion, the outer null expansion changes according to the right hand side. We here have the outer null expansion, and this is the shear squared. So in particular, um, you know, you, you can think that if I prescribe the induced metric on the sphere S here, I can integrate that equation along L and I will get my solution. So the solution theory, to the construction of solutions for this uh, characteristic uh, initial data is, you know, much more straightforward than solving this elliptic non-local problems here, okay? And we will discuss that uh, in more detail on some later slides. Are there any questions about, about the, these two setups for now? Now, um, you know, let me come to a general statement of the gluing problem for the Einstein equations. You know, I can naively ask in a very general fashion, um, is it possible to connect two given spacetimes as a solution to the Einstein equations? So you come and uh, you give me two solutions to the einstein vacuum equations and you ask me, can I produce a third one that isometrically contains both of them? And of course, such a construction, you know, uh, would be quite complicated because, you know, this, I mean, the, the Einstein equations in the full glory are, you know, are extremely intricate to, to study. So the, the way to go for us today is to say, look, um, let us remember that the Einstein equations are hyperbolic and have a well-posed initial value formulation, as we saw before. So let's consider the initial data gluing problem. So instead of gluing two solutions to the Einstein equations, I want to glue uh, two given initial, space initial data sets of the same type, um, meaning that I construct a third uh, initial data set, which you know, isometrically contains both of them. And then once I develop the space times associated to this um, glued initial data set, I have a version of uh, gluing two space times if you want. Okay? So this is the, the initial data gluing problem, and we will discuss it today for space-like initial data and for null initial data. So historically, it was the gluing of space-like initial data that is well studied by the Riemannian uh, geometry community. You know, before I wrote out, it's essentially the prescribed scalar coverage equation and the divergence equation for the second fundamental form. And when you study this geometric PDEs on, on uh, you know, on manifolds, um, there are two features that, um, you know, one always has in mind. On the one hand, there is this elliptic character that I already indicated before, from which you expect some rigidity features coming in. You know, 
you know, for example, you know, if you look at the Laplacian or something like that, you have unique continuation, and you expect somehow this to be reflected in the in the elliptic character of these constraint equations too. On the other hand, um, you know, we saw that the actual elliptic operator is a geometric operator. It's the prescribed scalar curvature, uh, which means you know that it's a coordinate independent thing. And there is a specific, uh, you know, there's a specific geometric freedom that we have in these green constructions, which should allow us some flexibility. So actually gluing constructions for the space-like constraint equations are an uh, interesting interplay between this rigidity and flexibility phenomena. But example one, uh, you know, we've probably all heard about this. One cannot localize non-trivial initial data to be trivial initial data outside the compact set by the positive mass theorem. Okay. Because if it was trivial outside the compact set, well, you know, it would be uh, exactly Minkowski and hence trivial. Now, the second example, um, so the first example, you know, it's, it's a very strong uh, statement about uh, rigidity, right? So you cannot glue it to, to Minkowski. There's something very, the positive mass theorem, there's a rigidity that blocks you from doing that. On the other hand, Covino Shen crucial delay, they um, showed nevertheless that you can glue to an explicit uh, family, namely, given any asymptotically flat space like initial data, uh, you can glue it to space like initial data for a Kerr black hole, where this uh, uh, Kerr black hole parameters of mass, linear momentum, angular momentum, center of mass are determined uh, throughout the gluing construction. Okay? Um, and in fact, you know, you can write the formula that says that the, um, the Kerr parameters are, you know, Epsilon close to the to the you know to the values of the given space like initial data set that this started out with. So you know you should think of this as a sphere very far out, very in the asymptotically flat region. And here you have like a gluing region where you glue to exactly curve. So here uh, this result shows us that we we are using the flexibility of the geometric character uh, to glue to curve, but you know the way the way I, I want to I want to present it is to say well, but the rigidity is still reflected in the fact that the curve parameters are determined here. Okay. Um, so what I want to discuss next is how does this rigidity come in to determine the parameters of this curve? Okay. So let me give you a quick sketch of the proof of this uh, covino shank gluing. First, you know, you far out in this asymptotically flat region, you just make a cutoff function to, to go from your original data set to the explicit curve data set. And of course, making such a, a manual labor cutoff is, uh, is you know, not gonna give you a solution to the constraint equations, but you will introduce an error. So the second step is to say, correct this error, um, essentially by studying the linearized gluing problem, around Minkowski, and then I'm just applying the implicit function theorem to, to, uh, co to correct this error. Okay. And of course, you know, it's, uh, it's technically it's, it's more involved than that, but that's the basic idea. So the problem is now with this approach is that the linearized operator um, for the constraint equations at the trivial solution is not subjective. In fact, it has a 10-dimensional co-kernel, uh, which cannot be overcome. And this is then uh, directly reflected in, in your ability to correct the error with the implicit function theorem. So if you were to just apply the implicit function theorem, at the end of the day, you were able to uh, glue to curve up to a 10-dimensional error. Okay? And this is exactly where the 10 curve parameters come in, because uh, beautifully, it can be shown that despite the fact that your linear operator, uh, you know, cannot correct this 10-dimensional error, choosing the 10 parameters of Kerr actually allows you to kill off that 10-dimensional uh, gluing error that you had in the gluing region still. So this is how um, the 10 Kerr parameters have to be used as extra parameters in this gluing construction. 
and they are thus determined in the process right? to produce a full solution uh, to the constraint equation. Okay, um, now let me let me uh, you know contrast that with our new approach, which is based on not gluing. It's where we say we go beyond linear methods, beyond studying the linear operator, and we utilize the structure of the quadratic nonlinearities of the constraint equations to overcome all obstructions. In our gluing, um, we, we, we leave the regime of the implicit function theorem and access the, the quadratic nonlinearities, you know, near Minkowski. So what is, the, what is the result that you can get by accessing the quadratic nonlinearities of the constraint equations? It's the following. And so this is work with uh, Rodiansky. Consider asymptotically flat space like initial data with some mass m sigma and some linear momentum t sigma, okay? Then you can glue this to any curve space like initial data set. So the curve, the curve parameters are not determined anymore. We've overcome this rigidity. However, there are some conditions to be satisfied, namely um, that the mass of the curve uh, that you glue to should, shall be larger than the mass that you started out with. In other words, the, um, the gluing procedure, it needs, you know, it needs to add a little mass to, to do its job. And on the other hand, um, you have that, you know, I will talk about this on the next slide, that the difference of masses shall be larger than the constant uh, times the difference of the linear momentum. Okay. We will, I will talk about this on the next slide. But in particular, as a corollary of this, of this gluing result, um, it follows that any asymptotically flat space like initial data set can be glued to spherically symmetric virtual space like initial data of sufficiently large mass. Because if you put uh, Schwarzschild of large mass here instead of Kerr, well, you know, you make it larger than M sigma. And, um, well, uh, P Schwarzschild is zero anyway, so you just make uh, M Schwarzschild large enough here, and you satisfy both of those inequalities, and you, you're doing the job, okay? So we can glue any uh, space like initial data set to Schwarzschild. Now, this inequality that we've based on the previous slide, um, it can be compared to a special relativity where the energy momentum vector MP of an observer uh, shall be time-like, which represents the fact that an observer uh, is traveling at less than the speed of light. Okay. In our analysis of this result, we did not yet optimize this constant C. For now, it's just a universal constant. And uh, that's uh, ongoing work to to show if it's one or how you know or what general what what is the the sharp constant here. Um, and let me just write out this interpretation that going to Schwarzschild of mass m uh, means that all angular momentum of the original space like initial latte is transferred into the mass. So you, if you want, it's a space like version of uh, like a Penrose process. Okay. Are there any questions about this space-like result at the moment? We overcome the we overcome the the rigidity of the constraint equations, and the main the main thing that remains is just a monotonicity of the of the energy. The, the more you go out, you know, the, the mass has to grow essentially. So that's a natural thing. Um, that this constant uh, depends on, so on, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in, in this gluing, um, you know, there, there are many ways to glue, and I choose specific cutoff functions, and uh, the constant depends on these cutoff functions. And, uh, you know, yeah. I choose the cutoff functions in an ad hoc way, and it's not clear that they produce the best constant. Um, so you know, that's, that's uh, a thing to, to study. But um, you know, another way to interpret this is to say that if you want to change the linear momentum from uh, the original value to the curve value that, that you want, you need to dispense a little mass to do that. 
and that's you know that's with classical physics you know if if you think of linear momentum being equal to mass times some velocity you know it tells you that you you need to add some mass to change the linear momentum no no yeah it's a it's a universal real number Um, so it does not depend on the initial data that you do the gluing with. But any other questions about this? Okay, so um, you know what is the strategy of the proof? The philosophy that um, I, I came to be acquainted with is to say that space-like gluing results follow generally as corollaries from null gluing results always. So now is the point where we move from this prelude uh, with the historic uh, space-like gluing problems to introduce the null gluing problem. And when you start introducing the null gluing problem, uh, a good starting point is uh, to discuss Aritaki's work on the null gluing problem for the scalar wave equation. So Aritaki studied um, the scalar wave equation on a general background G, so not close to Minkowski, but it can be very large. And let me just um, remind you for one second that the initial value problem for the scalar wave equation uh, on, you know, on a characteristic, uh, in, for characteristic initial lab is that you, know, you give me a sphere S and you consider the outgoing cone and the ingoing cone, which I call H and uh, H bar. And if I'm allowed to prescribe C along H and C along H bar, so just the Dirichlet values, then you know this forms a well-posed initial value problem for the scalar wave equation. Now I can I can essentially solve in the in the future diamond here. So this is, uh, the, well, sometimes called the Guza problem for the wave equation. And the null gluing problem um, for the wave equation is the following. I say, look, I start out with two characteristic initial data sets for the scalar wave equation. Um, one down here is on h bar one and h one, and up here h bar two, h two. And I consider c one to be the solution in here and c two the solution in here. And I'm asking, can I construct um, initial data along this red null hypersurface here, connecting S1 to S2, such that the resulting solution to that bigger initial data set here reproduces P1 in that uh, domain of dependence and P2 up here in that domain of dependence. So that's the, the setup of the, of the null gluing problem. So, as I just explained, the initial data consists of, consists of the free prescription of the value of C along these null hypersurfaces. So in this null gluing problem, our degree of freedom is to pick the value of C uh, along this red section of the null hypersurface. Okay? And the question is, can I pick C such that the resulting solution uh, agrees with up, up here and down here with the given one? Now, you know, as as uh, as uh, one as we will discuss now, there are obstructions to doing that that can be analyzed directly along this single null hypersurface here. Namely, if I write out the wave equation in double null coordinates, um, so you know, I, I so U and V are level sets of null hypersurfaces. I have that the L derivative is exactly dV, L bar is exactly dU. Then uh, we know that. The scalar wave equation essentially turns into this form here. So I have a dV derivative of this transversal derivative du of, well, and something depending on the metric times psi is equal to uh, an elliptic operator acting on psi. And this elliptic operator, it, uh, it only contains derivatives tangential to the, um, to the sphere here that foliates the null hypersurface, okay? And you can think of uh, this Q as you know, the Laplacian, if you want. In, in, uh, in Minkowski, this would be exactly the, the Laplacian of the round sphere. Well, um, 
that that is a a null transport equation for the transversal derivative d of psi. And that's that's the way I want to interpret it. So the value of d of psi is transported along the outgoing null hypersurface, where the source term de depends on uh, q psi. So, I'm sorry. And in particular, if you know, from this initial data set up here, I already know what is the value of d of psi, then I, g I get into a form of control problem. Like, um, on the one hand, you know, you start out with d of psi down here prescribed and d of psi up here prescribed, but at the same time, you have this, you know, ODE, if you want, for d of psi along the null generators, and you better make sure that, you know, that the source term here on the right-hand side uh, is chosen in this red region, such that really the solution of this ODE leads from your prescribed value to your prescribed value up here. So it's a control problem for the prescription of C along the red uh, null hyper surface. Okay, um, the first thing we note is that there can be problems. This, uh, this control problem is not always solvable. In fact, each uh, element of the co-kernel of this operator Q leads to a conservation law, which acts as obstruction to gluing. Say, for example, uh, in, the, in the case of Minkowski, this Q was exactly the Laplace operator. So if I project the whole equation on the constant functions, the right-hand side is going to vanish, and I will see that du of C, the constant part of it, is conserved along the outgoing R hypersurface, and there's nothing I can do about it with my prescription of uh, Psi. So uh, no matter what I try with my prescription, I will not be able to glue DU, the, the constant part of DU of Psi uh, in, in Minkowski. So conservation laws act as obstructions to null gluing. And in fact, Aritak is, you know, for in his theory for the, for the scalar wave equation, he showed that all obstructions from to null gluing come exactly from conservation laws. So it's an equivalent. I also want to mention that um, for any fixed order of partial U derivatives, there are at most finitely many conservation laws. So you, know, you can commute this wave equation with du um, to get transport equations for higher du derivatives of psi. And again, there will be an elliptic operator, which may have a co kernel But at any point, um, this operator Q is going to be Freytorn, and hence uh, it has finite dimensional co kernel okay. And hence, for each fixed order of transversal derivative, there are at most finitely many conservation laws. We will see in a second that for the Einstein equations, that's already not the case. Um, we will see that there are, there are immediately infinite, there's an infinite dimensional space of conservation laws for the linearized Einstein equations already. Now, um, on a generic background metric, uh, Aritakis showed that uh, null hypersurfaces do not admit conservation laws. However, uh, there are conserved charges that's, uh, on null cones in Minkowski. So this will be of interest for our uh, discussion today because we want to glue in the asymptotically flat region, which is close to Minkowski. So we will see this obstruction. Um, and second, there is a conserved charge on the horizons of extremal black holes, which um, eventually led to the celebrated Aritakis instability of extremal black holes. Okay. So clearly, the, studying the null gluing problem for the Einstein equations is on the one hand motivated by, by fully understanding the space-like gluing constructions and overcoming the obstructions there. And on the other hand, um, understanding the, the dynamics of uh, event horizons of extremal black holes. Okay. So, I have time until 10 past. Okay. So what's the, what's the initial value problem for the Einstein equations? Well, um, you know, characteristic initial data, as I said before, it's subject to these constraint equations called null structure equations. Um, I just wrote them out here again. They are transport equations along L. There are many more of them. I'm not going to write them out. And the basic idea is still that they are all, uh, they are all transport equations along L. 
And the special point about the null structure equations, um, which is not reflected in the space-like constraint equations, is that they admit a hierarchy. So I can take all these equations and rewrite them in a hierarchical form. And I'm able to freely prescribe uh, what, I, what we call a characteristic C, and then construct a directly associated solution to this null structure equation. So um, if you're familiar with the space-like constraint equations, there is the conformal method. But you know, the conformal method, I mean, it, it works essentially best with constant trace k. And if you don't have constant trace k, you know, there's some, you know, things don't decouple so nicely and, and the, the null structure equations don't have that problem. You can prescribe freely a seed and then there's a one-to-one -one correspondence to the solution. So it brings us back a little to this picture of the scalar wave equation where I could freely prescribe my value of C and I had the control problem. So the control problem for the Einstein equation is gonna be, can you prescribe this seed uh, in, a, in a nice way to, you know, to control this uh, transport problem. Now let me just um, quickly outline. So on the sphere, you prescribe uh, this outgoing and ingoing null expansions, the induced metric and the vector field. On H and H bar, you prescribe the conformal class of the induced metric on those spheres here. And as I said, from this freely prescribable characteristic seed, you integrate the null transport equations in a hierarchical order, so one after the other, and you can compute all metric components, Christopher symbols and null curvature components. It's really algorithmic. So you, you start with the characteristic seed, you start integrating for the metric, then the next null transport equation uses the seed and the metric to get the Ricci coefficient, and then the next equation uses uh, the Ricci coefficient, the metric, the seed, to get the null curvature component. So it's really a hierarchy. Okay, and then the, the statement of the null Gruing problem for the Einstein equations is similar to what we've discussed before. You know, given two data sets, um, can you prescribe characteristic initial data along this red section here, such that you lead you know, in a regular way from the data here up to the data there? As I said, uh, before the degrees of freedom is now the prescription of the characteristic seed along this red region. And again, the difficulty comes from the fact that the null structure equations transport metric coefficients, Christopher symbols and curvature, sim curvature components. So it could be again, as for the wave equation that you have a conservation law from down here to up here, which uh, prevents you from solving the null growing problem. But before going into that, um, I can already state that the null growing problem uh, above can in general not be solved in this version. Why? Because we know that the Rajoduri equation gives us a monotonicity property of the outer expansion. So if you were to prescribe me here a larger trace, k, trace he than down here, it's already doomed to fail. You can never produce a solution to the null structure equation. So you may say, okay, look, let's just uh, study this null Gruing problem in the vicinity of Minkowski, where, you know, at least, so, so if I put something close to Minkowski and something close to Minkowski, I'm not gonna run into this monotonicity problem. But then actually you run into a more subtle obstruction is that when you try to solve the linearized null Gruing problem, they, the null structure equations admit an infinite dimensional space of conservation loss. So you see that the linear problem is, uh, you know, in, if you want, it's really degenerate. And so you, you need to go into the problem and try to understand what are all those conservation laws. And uh, we were able to show that um, this infinite dimensional space of conservation laws, it splits into two parts. First, infinitely many, what we call gauge dependent conservation laws and a 10 dimensional space of gauge invariant charges. So essentially what we did is we said, um, 
I, I have this, so on each sphere, I know that there exists a charge. There exists infinite, infinitely many charges. So we looked at each charge and we said, how, the, how does this charge change if we perturb this uh, sphere a little bit, you know? If instead of, the, in, instead of one fixed sphere, I, uh, I change uh, the sphere to another nearby sphere. Does the charge change linearly, quadratically? Can I use these perturbations to adjust the charges even? And the splitting um, was defined in this way that if your charge can be adjusted by perturbing this, this sphere, then we call it gauge dependent. And if it's quadratically changing only, then we call it gauge invariant. So we had to relax a little bit this null gluing problem from saying that I grew from a fixed sphere as one to a fixed sphere as two. I had to allow myself to study this, what we call perturbative null gluing problem, where I start from a sphere as one and I'm allowing myself to glue to this green sphere that lies close to my original sphere as two in uh, some ingoing null hypersurface where I assume that I'm, I have some data too that is uh, close to Minkowski, okay? And then the, the question is, um, can you glue from S1 to a perturbation of S2, um, uh, you know, killing, killing off all these infinitely many uh, gauge dependent charges? And that's exactly what you can do. So you solve the, the linearized problem with these linearized uh, perturbations of the sphere, you apply the implicit function theorem, the IFT setup is very straightforward, and you get to prove that, yes, you can prove, you can glue from S1 to a perturbation, and the only thing that you were not able to glue uh, was the, the, the 10 dimensional space of gauge invariant conservation laws. Okay. Um, which were exactly, if you want, the, the co kernel of your, of your linear S problem, okay? And, you know, this co kernel it can, also, it can again be identified with energy, linear momentum, angular momentum, center of mass. So at this point, um, we are at a similar stage as, wa as was the, the space-like gluing problem. The linear S problem ended up with 10 charges that we couldn't overcome. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, you need to get these 10 parameters from somewhere. So, if, for example, if you apply this, you can also do the gluing to curve with null methods, fine. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip on that for a second. So this is exactly where the, where the obstruction-free null gluing comes in. So at this point, we're saying we have this 10-dimensional space of quantities that we were not able to overcome with the linear methods. But can we pick, um, you know, our characteristic seed along this way here, such that it accesses the quadratic nonlinearities of the constraint equations and allows us eventually to adjust these uh, 10 gauge invariant charges in a, you know, in a, um, that were not accessible before. So let's look at that for a second. I want to go specifically to the energy integral and the linear momentum integral. And you, know, you, you can write out that the energy is the, is the L is equal to zero mode of this function M, and the linear momentum is the L is equal to one function, uh, uh, are the L is equal to one mode of this function M. Uh, this function M, you, know, you can think of it as uh, the null curvature component rho. So in Minkowski, it's zero, in Schwarzschild, it's proportional to the mass. Okay. So the, this, this exact thing, the formula doesn't matter. It's important that E is the L is equal to zero mode, and P is the L is equal to one mode. Now, if I'm interested in, in how E and P are linearly conserved from here, you know, as a conservation law, how they are obstructing my null doing, I look at the null transport equation for M, and at the end of the day, I get this representation formula that says E up here, you know, I integrate the ODE, I get, uh, you know, by fundamental theorem of calculus, the formula, the energy up here minus the energy down here, the difference is given by the integral over he hat squared, and for the linear momentum by the integral over the L is equal to one mode of he hat squared. 
um, E hat squared in the implicit function theorem setup is a quadratic quantity. So uh, in this implicit function theorem setup, I know that delta E and delta P is going to be of size epsilon squared, which means it's linearly conserved. That was exactly the problem that we ran into. So now the idea of the, of the obstruction free gluing is that is there a way to make this he had large? Namely, I, I, I see that if he had was of size square root of epsilon, then this whole expression would be of size epsilon. And it means I can glue epsilon sized differences of the energy and the linear momentum. Yeah? So how can we make uh, he had he had to be of size uh, square root of epsilon? Um, so first, I want to mention that p, uh, you know, by the first variation equation before, it's the L derivative of the metric, and this metric, you know, I can. That's essentially the thing that I'm prescribing with my characteristic seed. So I want to prescribe my characteristic seed such that its L derivative is huge, but at the same time, I need g slash itself to be still close to Minkowski so that all my operator estimates go through without any issues. Now, you know, if I think of what function has a large derivative but itself is small, um, I arrive at a high frequency function. So I want to have he had to have this epsilon size term from the linear theory to glue, you know, all these uh, other terms that didn't give me a problem. And I want to assume that he had this of size square root of epsilon to get me exactly this large E and P gluing times uh, a high frequency function sinus of e over epsilon. Now, the sinus of e over epsilon, uh, it helps me a lot because, you know, well, if, if, I in, if we integrate he had to get my g slash, um, every time I'm integrating a high frequency function, I'm winning epsilon. So the metric is going to be epsilon to the 3 half close to Minkowski. So in particular, all the, you know, all the operators and stuff is still close to Minkowski. And similar for all other terms, you know, if you think of eta or any curvature components, you always integrate the seed. And integrating means getting extra smallness from this term. So these high frequency ansatz make sure that the only big thing is he had and the rest still stays small. Okay. Now, of course, I'm not talking about alpha, which is the L derivative of here. So let me just um, let me just finish the talk by, by, uh, by making the conclusion of what's the outcome of this high frequency. So he had was of size squared of epsilon. So he had squared is of size epsilon. Now, the interesting part is that if you take the square of a high frequency function, you get a low frequency function. Okay? So if I put this he had square formula in my delta E, delta P formulas, I can pull out the, the epsilon. And I get that at the end of the day, um, I have epsilon times an integral over this w squared. And this w squared, it was just um, you know, a smooth low frequency symmetric two times that I picked by myself. So you think of this as uh, you know, a function that you can prescribe as you want. So at the end of the day, it boils down to the question, you know, you know that you want to glue delta E by some amount proportional to epsilon. Can you pick this tensor W such that W squared integrated uh, gives you exactly uh, the difference that you wanted to glue? And that the L is equal to one mode of W squared integrated gives you exactly the amount uh, of P that you wanted to glue. So this is really a, you know, a very uh, straightforward um, Fourier problem, you know, and maybe, maybe that's the closest thing to spectral theory that we see in this talk. Um, so, you know, assuming the inequalities of the main theorem above hold, so delta p, you know, is smaller than delta e, it is possible to choose w such that the above integrals take on prescribed values. Mm -hmm. You know, explicitly what you do is you pick w to be a, a linear combination of spherical harmonics of mod L is equal to and L is equal to three uh, times some, uh, some nice uh, cutoff functions 
and uh, you, you decide the constants in front, you make it work out. At the same time, now we really understand where, where uh, this inequality between delta E and delta P came in the beginning of this talk, because you, know, you cannot choose a large value of the L is equal to one mode of a square without also you know, making the L is equal to zero mode of the square large. The L is equal to zero mode of the square is like the L2 norm. You can make the L2 norm large while as small as small as zero while having this uh, large. Okay. So that's how, how these inequalities come in. Um, you know, there are some other technical remarks that you know you so you show that this uh, this answer gives you well-defined characteristic initial data. You show that it's sufficiently regular to apply local existence for the Einstein equations. And, um, and once you have uh, constructed this initial data, you, you know, from, from a, a space, from a NARP gluing construction, you glue up, you glue down, and then you develop downwards and you get a, a space like construction. So I had to skip that part a little, but uh, that's, you know, once you have solved the nar gluing problem, you just evolve downward to get the solution to the, to the space-like gluing problem. And I think that's everything I wanted to say. <laughs>